All right, so let's talk about the science section. The science section of the ACT is unique in that it's not like the math or the English sections. The math section, you just have to know the math. The English section, you just have to know the rules and you can do well. The science section, they have to present almost all of the information to you in the passages, which makes it really easy to find tips and tricks to do really well and increase your score pretty quickly. So one main problem with the science section is that there's 40 questions and only 35 minutes to do it, which means there's timing is everything. And the place where you burn up the most time is reading, especially if you have to go back and reread something. So a lot of the strategies we're gonna be talking about to beat the science test are don't read anything that you don't need to and don't reread anything if you can help it. To understand how to do this, I just really need to show you. The first passage I have here on this older uh, practice exam is what we call a data representation passage. It's a format of passage. It means that there's going to be lots of figures and graphs and charts. We also don't need to read anything unless we absolutely have to right? Most of the time it's going to be some kind of definition that's not given on the graphs that we may need. For example, here in the first part, I would only read this if a question asked me about it, but I would also box this sleep factor protein here, excuse my poor boxing skills, just so I don't have to refine that if I need to know what this S plus gene stands for. I can just immediately look, know where to find it. Oh yeah, sleep factor protein. We're good to go. So let me show you an example of how we can answer one of these questions without reading almost anything. Let's start with question two. According to figure two, figure two is what we like to call location clue. It tells you where your eye is supposed to look. Figure two, the amount of recovery sleep per day per fly for the S plus S plus genotype was approximately how many times as great as that for the S plus S minus genotype? Okay, lots of genotypes and uh, technical jargon, we don't have to know any of that. We don't have to understand it. Because if I go to figure two, I can really pull some good information. Look at this x-axis, it says genotype. I don't need to know what a genotype is, I just know that that's what it is. That's where I can find it. Amount of recovery sleep per fly per day. That's what it asked about in the question. That's on my y-axis, right? So now I know that I'm looking at this genotype here, S plus, S minus, and S plus, S plus and I'm supposed to compare their y-axis values. I can see that the S plus S minus bar is about half the size of the S plus S plus bar. So I'm gonna go down here, reread the end of my question. For the S plus S plus genotype was approximately how many times as great as that for the S plus S minus genotype? About two, right? It was double the size. So I can circle F and move on about my life. And that was pretty quick. Didn't have to read, didn't have to understand what a genotype is. I'm just moving through things. And a lot of the times, this is the case for the data representation passages. So now let's scroll down here. We're gonna go all the way down to passage five for this next part. The next type of format is the research summaries format. You can identify these because they have italic subheadings that say study one or experiment one or experiment two. This particular one has three studies, as we can see. And the what's going to be happening is they're going to be conducting some sort of experiment. We need to understand the procedure for that experiment, why they're doing what they're doing. So we do have to do a little bit more reading. Look for a paragraph such as this one that explains the steps that they perform to set it up. In each trial of the study is an aluminum strip having a thickness D. That is an important... Uh, distinction that they've made there. They've told us what D is. It's the thickness. We want to box that. We may need that later. Was clamped to a ring stand. The two ends of the strip were connected to an electrical circuit containing a DC power supply and the two edges were connected to a voltmeter as shown in figure two. Okay, I can kind of see and visualize everything that's going on there. I'm going to continue. The strip was also positioned horizontally between the poles and the electromagnet. The students adjusted the power supply output as needed to the desired current I. Current I. Great. Flowed through the strip. Finally, the students adjusted the electromagnet as needed to produce the magnetic field strength B. So I'm going to box those and recorded the resulting VH. 
I don't know what VH is, but I can tell it's important. That's what they're looking for, right? They're changing I and changing B and looking for VH. So I'm going to go back and let's see if we can find it here. I do see a little VH. It's right here. VH stands for voltage. Now, I don't understand everything there is to know about the experiment, but I can go back and figure that out if I need to, if the question prompts me to. But I can tell that we're studying D, I, B to find VH. That's all that I've picked up on so far. So let's do another couple of questions here. 23 is a good example of questions that ask you to understand what is going on and why they chose to do certain things. The clamp that fastened a strip to the ring stand was electrically insulated from the strip. This insulation was most likely needed to, and then we've got some answer choices here, promote the flow of electrons between the clamp and the strip. Okay, this is a little bit of one of those questions where you have to know a little bit before. If you know what an insulator is, this becomes a little easier. An insulator keeps things from moving, right? So think about the insulation in your house. It keeps the heat in, keeps the cold out, or vice versa. So insulators aren't going to promote the flow of anything. So we can pretty much remove A. Prevent the flow of electrons between the clamp and the strip. That seems likely. Let's just double check the answers. Ensure that the strip remained at room temperature or ensure that the strip did not reach room temperature. Okay, the only thing here is we've read about all these things and we've read about current and strength or a, a magnetic field strength and voltage, nothing about temperature. So I'm gonna go ahead and say that C and D are not viable. So the answer should be B. So be sure you can understand what it is that we're studying by the time that you finished all the questions. This is typically a question I would leave for last just because by answering all these other questions, I'll learn more about the experiment as I go through. The other question I wanted to look at was question number 24. In study one, there's another location clue, so we're gonna circle that. Which variable was independent and which variable was dependent? Again, here they require you to know, know that uh, the difference between independent and dependent variables. Independent is something you select or change, and then dependent is what you measure. So study one, again, without reading a whole ton, it looks like they picked an I and read V. Just to make sure, I'm going to go ahead and reread this little section here. With D equal to 15, B equal to 0 0.6, the students found VH for various I. So yeah, they're setting I and they're reading VH. So I is going to be our independent variable since we're picking it, and VH is our reading, which makes it our dependent variable. So the answer here is G. Again, not reading a whole ton, only reading when I absolutely have to. So let's go on now to the final passage, which is an example of our final passage format, conflicting viewpoints. There should only be one of these per exam, and again, you can identify it by looking for italic subheadings that say students or scientists or hypotheses, something like that. I'll summarize this passage for you so we can move on to other things, but this passage, essentially they're burning a candle, they put a jar over it, after a while, the, uh, the candle, of course, extinguishes, and they're trying to explain why that happens. The biggest thing with conflicting viewpoints is you don't want to read the whole passage and then try and answer the questions. It's going to be too hard. You're going to forget which student said what, what scientist said this. Um, the best thing to do is read the setup, then read, this, read the questions and go through and circle those location clues. Here we only really have two questions with location clues. Questions 30 and 31 talk about student 1 and student 2 respectively. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to read student 1's point of view, then come answer this question because it's fresh on my mind. Then I'll go back, read student 2, answer his question because it's on my mind. And then once I've done that, I can read student 3 and 4 and come back and answer the rest of the questions. So real quickly... Student one, the candle's flame results from a combustion reaction. When the candle is lit, the flame then lights the candle, heats the wax, or heats the candle, which causes the candle to give off fumes of wax. The wax fumes act as a fuel. So right there, that seems like a pretty key point. He said the wax fumes act as a fuel. 
as you do this more, you'll realize that a lot of these passages have a similar format when they're giving their points. For I'm guessing that each student later will tell what they think acts as a fuel. So we're going to keep going. That reacts with the O2 present in the air. I think that's going to probably be a pretty key point as well. The reaction gives off energy, which heats the surrounding air, producing a flame. If the jar is placed over the lit candle, the candle will soon stop burning because the O2 in the air under the jar will be quickly used up. I bet you they'll differ on that as well. So now that I've read student one, I go down here and answer his question. Which of the following unbalanced equations for the reaction that occurs when a candle is lit is most consistent with student one's viewpoint? He said that wax fumes react with oxygen. That's all he really told us, but there's only one answer choice that does that. So we can pick F and move on. We'll quickly do uh, question number 31. Based on student two's viewpoint, how will the concentrations of O2 and N2 in the jar vary with time, if at all, after the jar is placed over the lit candle? So now I'm going to go read student two and do his. Student one is correct, except that the fuel reacts with N2, not O2, in the air. So he said that the concentration of N2 will be used up quickly, right? So we would expect N2 to decrease, so I can eliminate C and D. And he didn't say that O2 really did anything. So it should just remain constant, and our answer choice here should be B. So there you go. That's the best way that I can tell you how to skip through and not read very much during the science portion. Again, timing is key here. You need every second that you can get. And if you put these into practice and practice getting good at those different formats and what strategies to use, you can beat the science section. Hi, I'm Troy. And if you liked this video, then you'll love the ACT course I've helped author with Achievable. Achievable has everything that you need to get a top score. We have a comprehensive online textbook, more videos just like these on dozens of key topics, a built-in study planner to help keep you on track, hundreds of chapter review questions, and plenty of full-length practice exams. Our course is competitively priced, and you can try it out first for free to see if our style is the right fit for you. Follow the link in the description below to get started.